Uh, when I was in my early college years, uh, I was a counselor for a youth group made up of two churches that didn't uh, have many youth in each individual church, but together we actually formed a pretty decent sized youth group. Um, and I always thought that it was funny that we used the word counselor to describe a position that basically amounts to something more like a chaperone. It's not like I was counseling these young people all the time. I really didn't do much of that, but I did do an awful lot of chaperoning. So the director of the group was really interested in helping us to become better at our jobs, developing us as leaders of youth. So we would go to seminars and conferences about working with youth, and I'll never forget what a workshop leader once told my group about working with these folks. He quoted some study that asked high school kids if they could name five people that they knew who loved them unconditionally. A large majority, like around 70%, said that they could not. They could not name five people they knew to love them unconditionally. And that made me very, very sad. Then I did the next logical thing, logical to me anyway. I started trying to see if I could think of five people that I knew who loved me that way. Now, I was happy to say that I could do it. I could. Now, the next thing the leader said was what made his words really stick with me. He said that the study indicated that those who could name five or more people who loved them unconditionally tended to be more successful in school, reported feeling far more content with their lives, far more at peace in their hearts. Those with fewer than five had increased levels of negative emotions like fear, anger, anxiety, and depression. They also did worse in school, as you can imagine. And the fewer they could name, the worse things got for them. Now, the leader told us that as church leaders in such close contact with youth, we had to be one of those people, one of those five. And more importantly, know that those youth believed it. It wasn't enough for us to say, I love you unconditionally and try our best to show it. They had to believe it and we had to know that they believed it. Anything less and we were failing them. Now before that seminar, I had no idea how high the stakes were in the job that I was doing. I, I just thought I was a volunteer, you know, some, in some glorified position of some... I, but after that seminar, I, I knew I had to be more. And as I got to know these youth more and more, understand their struggles, understand how things like suicide are like an ever-present thing in their minds, and all the things they're dealing with, the hormones, I knew I had to step my game up. There is something about love and knowing that we are loved that makes us better people. Anyone who owns a dog or has children or is in love knows these things. Anyone that is loved and knows that they are loved knows these things. So last week we ruminated on the Lord's baptism and what was really happening to those people that would come to John the Baptist at the River Jordan. Now, through Jesus' story, we learn that in baptism, we can experience God's love almost tangibly. We can feel it. And with an open heart, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are beloved, as Christ heard the Lord say, you are my beloved child. That you, God's handiwork, the work of God's hands, are well-pleasing to God. But what if I told you that you're not just beloved? That you, in fact, give the Lord joy. And that God is at work all the time trying to help you learn that. Understand that. Now, I'm not sure I understood that idea until I became a father. But I did experience something like it well before. Now, I love to cook, um, but I get joy from it the most when I cook for people that I love. I get no joy from just cooking for myself. I savor the expressions on their faces, you know, the, the delight 
in the food that I provide, the thanks that I get afterward. When I became a husband, I delighted in knowing that I could give my wife joy, even through simple things, you know, little things. And she would do the same in turn. But when I became a father, I mean, yes, parenthood is very hard, but there is something about the tiniest things that my tiny human does that just make me giggle, you know? Even stuff that he shouldn't be doing, you know? That sometimes that's the best stuff. It's truly amazing how these little things really get to you. Sometimes it's big stuff, you know? Like the way that he goes to his book bin in the morning, he grabs a book and he brings it to me and he wants me to read it. I'm like, oh, that's the best. Now, I believe without any doubt, any doubt in my mind, that there is a God and that that God loves me. See, it's my faith that informs this belief, and it has been tested. I know the Lord to be a forgiving God, first and foremost, and I know that that God is invested in my salvation because I've seen and felt things happen in my life that I could only explain as God's work and presence. I believe that like me with Abraham or my wife or any of my loved ones, God looks on me with joy as God sees the things that I do. I didn't come to these realizations overnight, but over the course of my life, And they have helped me to believe that God is real and that God is love. And I know that many others have not. For them, God is not real, nor is God's love. They don't have the history that God and I do. Every relationship is defined by its history. No history, no relationship. Now, I also believe that God expects a great deal from us. God knows the difficulties that we face from within and without. God has this acute understanding of our tendency towards selfishness and weakness and demands the transformation of our bodies and souls. But as we know very well, you can demand all you want. It doesn't mean that anything is going to change. I've worked for good bosses, I've worked for some bad ones, and let me tell you, the bad ones always had one thing in common. They demanded results in an authoritarian way, but they could not be bothered to lift a finger to help me excel. They didn't care about me as a person. They only cared about what I could do for them and for their bottom line. I didn't last very long at places like that. I imagine you didn't either. But the best ones, wow, they took the time. They worked with me to help me become better. I knew that they, like me, understood that we would be spending several hours out of each day together. And though we both had a job to do, if we were going to be successful, we had to respect each other at the end of the day. We might not like each other, we might not love each other, but we would respect one another. And it turns out those kinds of bosses were the ones that I loved. They were, and I knew they loved me too. That was the kind of relationship that we had. They expected excellence, just like the bad ones, but unlike working for the bad ones, I wanted to deliver excellence. I wanted to deliver it. I wanted to be better. They strove for it. I strove for it. But before we could get to that point, I had to know that my boss actually cared about me. And it all started on day one. So the wedding at Cana is what the author of the Gospel of John describes as Jesus' first sign. Uh, Think of a sign as sort of a miracle that points to him as the long-expected Messiah. In scripture, as in life, firsts 
are important. The Gospel of Mark describes how Jesus exercised a demon in the first thing that Jesus did in that Gospel. So Jesus is a liberator there. Luke reports that Jesus' first thing is a sermon in his hometown synagogue about release, freedom, healing. You heard that story today as well. What these stories of firsts do is to set the tone for the kind of Jesus that the author is describing, their personal perspective of the Lord, of who the Lord is for them, who they think you should think the Lord is. So that's what firsts do, right? They set the tone. And what tone is the author of John setting? Well, if you like wine, the best one. Jesus, in front of his mother, uh, disciples, and gathered servants, turns water collected into six stone water jars, each holding, and I don't know if you paid attention to this as it was being read to you, 20 to 30 gallons of hand-drawn water. I mean, how long did that take, right? Six of those. And turns them into enough wine to fill a thousand bottles. Now, like so much going on in scripture, a collection really of writings written in a time that we barely understand, there is something at work here that we might not be getting. So in a time where fresh, clean water was very hard to come by, wine, with its antiseptic properties, was a staple. Everyone drank it. If you're at a wedding of the time, the wine tended to be a little better than normal, right? No tuba chuck. Now to run out of wine at a Jewish wedding, though, wasn't just an inconvenience. I mean, it was a disaster. First, while the host would ante up a lot of that wine, the cost would be way too much for just one household to handle, so the guests that came would bring some to share so that there would be enough for everyone. Now wine was a sign of the harvest. It was a sign of God's abundance, gladness, joy, hospitality, all those things. These weddings would sometimes last three days Right? You needed to have enough wine for three days. It was important. So you see what the stakes were if the wine ran out. It's practical and it's spiritual. Imagine what that meant for the couple, for their parents, the guests. You know, if we were at a wedding and something like that happened, you know, oh well, party's over, right? No more wine. Let's drive home. Not in those days, right? How long would it take someone to trek the 30, 80 miles back home, right? Nothing to drink. So Jesus takes all that water, right, and turns it into the best wine. And plenty of it. More wine than all those guests could have drank in not just three days, Try three weeks, like it was nothing. Holy Ghost Reserve, right? (laughs) Overwhelming joy and abundance. That is the product of John's Messiah. Overwhelming joy and abundance. The, The God of John's gospel is a God of overwhelming joy and abundance. What do you think those people thought about God after the secret of where that wine came from was revealed, right? Overwhelming joy and abundance that God would see fit to grace this wedding, this small group of people gathered together to enjoy each other's company and bless them in this huge way, right? Such a seemingly inconsequential event in the grand scheme of things, but it sets the tone. The scripture says, and his disciples believed in him. I mean, miracles can do that, sure. But there's more at work here than just seeing water become wine. I'm sure that was spectacular to witness. But there's more to it than that. Every miracle Jesus did 
was seen in the context of God doing God's work. He wouldn't say, hey guys, I'm great, I'm the Messiah, watch me use my magic powers and behold, now praise me. No, he said praise God because the only reason I have power is because God gave it to me. Every miracle Jesus did was seen in the context of God doing God's work. So you can imagine what something like this must have meant to people. I mean, I wonder what that bride and groom had to say about what God had done that day to their children, assuming they had any, of course, or their friends, about who God was for them about what God decided to do on the day of their wedding. Now, we often wonder at how one person, this Jesus, was able to have such an impact on the world when you consider that his ministry was only three years long. But see, that's the power of love in people's lives. He cast a message of love, and love brings out the best in us. If we don't know love, we act selfishly. You know, fear, anxiety, anger, depression, these negative emotions arise out of a lack, out of a scarcity of some kind. All that negativity floating around out there right now is about how we don't have enough money or food or security or privilege. It leads us to abandon our relationships to care for ourselves. But love? I don't mean fleeting love here. I'm talking steadfast love, the proven kind of love. It happens today, and you know it's going to happen tomorrow, and next week, and next month, and next year. Steadfast love, love built over time. You put the time in. That stuff fills us up like nothing can. It can save us from our selfish desires so that we can live for higher values. And the lives that we touch in the process, seeing them flourish, like watching Abe grow up, seeing them flourish, it's such a good feeling. It's a feeling worth living for and fighting for, and dying for. I'd ask you to join me in prayer now. Let's pray to God for for that feeling. How awesome it is that you care for us, God of all life. Your delight in us brings out our best. When you rejoice in us, you bring out our capacity for goodness. When your light and salvation dawn in our lives, we want to share that joy. Help us to share that joy. Help us to recognize your gifts within us so that we can use them to serve people in need, that they might know the love that we know well. And if we don't know that love, Melt our hearts of stone so that we can feel what it is you want us to feel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.